Dee Vacorda my name is James Nagel, welcome to The Irish Nation Lives. Michael Collins was born on the 16th of October 1890 in Woodfield, County Cork. Legend has it that on his deathbed in 1897, his father pointed to him and told the family, Mind that child, he'll be a great man yet, and will do great things for Ireland. Collins was doted upon by his mother and his seven older siblings, while he would go on to be known as the big fellow and the man who won the war, he would be known by his family, even after death, simply as Baby. Collins attended Lissavard National School until he moved to Clonakilty Secondary to prepare for the civil service exam, which he sat in February of 1906. Though he performed poorly, a number of students ahead of him dropped out, and in July he was summoned to London to take up a position as a boy clerk in the Post Office Savings Bank, the lowest rung in the gargantuan British civil service. Collins threw himself into Irish life in London and took up numerous, often thankless, positions in the emerging Irish civil service. Register for the County Board of the London GAA, Auditor and later Secretary of the Geraldine's GAA Club. He joined the Gaelic League as soon as he arrived, and in 1908 he joined Sinn Féin. Still in his late teens, he came under the influence of fellow Corkman Sam Maguire and Patrick Belton, who would swear him into the Irish Republican Brotherhood the secret oath-bound society that Collins would eventually come to control. In April 1910, he left the civil service, joining Horn & Co brokerage on Moorgate Street in the city of London, the financial heart of the empire. In 1913, as the home rule crisis was kicking off, units of the Irish volunteers were formed in London, and Collins joined up at King's Cross, where he was quickly appointed as a section commander. With the outbreak of the World War, he was made redundant when his employer closed shop to enlist, but he quickly found work at the Guarantee Trust Company, an institution that he would later use for government banking. There was pressure mounting on all men of fighting age, and as rumours of conscription grew, Collins briefly considered travelling to the United States, where a brother of his could help him to find work. He made a trip to Dublin in November of 1915 while pondering his future, and was there introduced to Joseph Plunkett, who was having trouble with the bookkeeping on his family's extensive estate at Kimmage. Through IRB links, Collins was suggested as an assistant. Plunkett was the Irish Volunteers' Director of Military Operations, but also a member of the IRB Military Council, the committee then planning an uprising against British rule. He had only recently returned from Germany, where he had met with government officials to discuss the rising, and he had also tried to help with Roger Casement's attempts to raise an Irish brigade. Plunkett was greatly impressed with Collins, and it's likely he was told of plans for the rising, now scheduled for Easter. Collins returned briefly to London, but the introduction of conscription in January of 1916, from which Ireland was exempt, meant he was on his way back across the Irish Sea with many other British-based and born members of the Irish Volunteers. Room would be made for them in converted sheds on the Plunkett estate, where they would train and help with preparations for the Rising, coming to be known as the Kimmage Garrison. Plunkett promoted Collins to the rank of captain in the Irish Volunteers and made him one of his aides de camp. Plagued by ill health, Plunkett was recovering from surgery when Collins escorted him to Liberty Hall on Easter Monday 1916. There they met with Patrick Pierce, James Conley and members of the Irish Citizen Army under his command. Along with the Kimmage garrison, they formed the Headquarters Battalion of the High Command Staff and marched on the General Post Office. After helping Plunkett to a back room where he could rest, Collins was appointed to the government bodyguard and presumably escorted Pierce when he read the proclamation of the Irish Republic to the bemused citizens of Dublin. These are awfully lofty sounding titles and indeed they are little more than that. Officers of Collins's rank and higher were in no short supply. One observer noted... There seemed to be a superabundance of officers hanging around with nothing particular to do. There seemed to be one officer to every three men. Collins did a number of odd jobs, from briefly guarding James Conley to assisting in demolishing walls. By Thursday, Joe Good, a member of the Kimmage garrison, found him in a small windowless room guarding a ladder to the roof, later remarking, It was a post of little honour or danger. He looked bad-tempered, a case of Achilles sulking in his tent. The GPO was far from the main action, and when it came, it did so in the form of long-range artillery. When the building caught fire on Friday, Collins fought it floor by floor with another member of Plunkett's staff, and when the order came to evacuate, he assisted in building barricades to provide cover for the escape to Moore Street. He was present the following morning, when the leadership took the decision to surrender. 
In the aftermath of the rising, almost 3,500 suspects were arrested nationwide, and 1,800 of these, including Collins, were deported to Britain. Franguk internment camp in North Wales had opened in June to house most of the prisoners, and here Collins made a name for himself. Though he was little known in the wider Republican movement, he became the effective leader of the volunteers who, like himself, had travelled from Britain to take part in the Rising. He wrote to Art O'Brien of the Irish National Aid and Volunteer Dependent Fund about attempts to arrest and conscript them, and wrote about prison conditions in general. O'Brien would later organise the purchase and shipment of weapons to Ireland at Collins's request. At Frangoch, he built a small, loyal group around him who would serve him in the years ahead, men such as Sean Hales, Richard Mulcahy and Dick McKee. The camp was closed in December of 1916 and the prisoners held there returned home to a hero's welcome. Collins was able to use his financial experience and his new network to gain employment as secretary of the Irish National Aid in Dublin. Headed by Kathleen Clark, the fund provided money to the dependents of those killed or imprisoned and helped the newly released to get back to work. Collins became the face of the fund in Dublin and his name was on every cheque. The job helped further his reputation and build his network, bringing him into contact with the most important figures of the Irish Revolution. His first foray into the new Irish political landscape was in February, when he briefly assisted with Count Plunkett's North Roscommon by-election campaign. It was Collins who suggested Joseph McGuinness for the next by-election in Longford in May of 1917. Still in prison, McGuinness refused the nomination, but Collins ignored this and put him forward anyway. Throughout the year, a number of organisations set about rebuilding themselves, and in many cases, Collins took a leading part. He was co-opted onto the executive of the Irish Volunteers and helped to draft their new manifesto. When Thomas Ash was released from prison in June, he took Collins on as a protégé to help him rebuild the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Ash took over as president and Collins was made secretary, as well as representing the South of England on the Supreme Council. In August, Ash was arrested for a seditious speech given in Longford and sentenced to a year's hard labour in prison. He went on hunger strike, demanding to be recognised as a prisoner of war instead of a criminal. However, on the 25th of September, he was force-fed by prison staff, and died that evening. His funeral on the 30th of September was a massive propaganda spectacle and a show of force by the Irish volunteers, with over 30,000 people following the coffin to Glasnevin Cemetery. Michael Collins was chosen to deliver the graveside oration, and after a volley of gunfire he stepped forward and declared, Nothing more remains to be said. That volley that we have just heard is the only speech which is proper to make over the grave of a dead Fenian. This took many by surprise, Collins was still not well known, and the crowd had expected a rousing oration such as was delivered by Patrick Pierce at the funeral of O'Donovan Rossa in 1915. But Collins was sending a message. There was a new, young generation on the rise who cared little for words. They meant business. In October, Collins was elected to the 24-person executive at the Sinn Féin Ardèche, and at the Irish Volunteers' Convention he was appointed Director of Organisation, the position last held by Patrick Pierce. The German Spring Offensive in March 1918 led to the British government extending conscription to Ireland, a move that was massively unpopular. Sinn Féin and the Irish Volunteers played a prominent role in organising resistance to conscription, and in May, the British authorities moved against the leadership. Collins had received limited information about a roundup and tried to warn those who were to be arrested. He rushed to the house of the new IRB president, Sean McGarry, but got there too late. Over 70 leading figures were captured, including Eamon de Valera, Arthur Griffith and Countess Markievicz. The German plot arrests saw Collins's importance and power grow. His friend Harry Boland was elected as the new IRB president and both men took over the jobs of those arrested in Sinn Féin. They played a pivotal role in organising the party's campaign in the 1918 general election. Collins was elected unopposed as a member of Parliament for South Cork, and in December he was part of the Foreign Affairs Committee which travelled to London hoping to meet President Woodrow Wilson. When the US ambassador said that this would be impossible, Collins suggested that they kidnap the President, much to the horror of the other members of the committee. Though he returned briefly to Ireland to help organise the opening of Dáil Éireann, he wasn't present on the 21st of January 1919 when he was appointed as Minister for Home Affairs. He and Harry Boland used the opening as cover to travel to England to break Eamon de Valera out of Lincoln Jail. In April, when de Valera was elected as president of Dáil Éireann, he appointed Michael Collins as Minister for Finance, 
a hugely important role as he was put in charge of the Dáil loan. The German plot arrests also solidified in Collins' mind the need for better intelligence gathering. In January of 1919, he met with Detective Sergeant Eamon Broy, the source within the Dublin Metropolitan Police who had provided the information. In April, Broy smuggled Collins into DMP headquarters, where he spent the night reading their files on the Republican movement back as far as the 1850s, and he would use this information to build his own counterintelligence operation. In July, he established an active service unit, which would become known as the Squad, and on his orders they would threaten and kill high-ranking members of the DMP. In March of 1920, Alan Bell, a magistrate sent to track down and confiscate money raised in the Dáil loan, was taken from a tram in broad daylight and shot on the side of the street. The intelligence war in Dublin would culminate with the killing of 14 members of the Cairo gang on the 21st of November 1920. Collins became one of the most wanted men in the British Empire during the War of Independence and supposedly never slept in the same place two nights in a row. Utilising his network and his positions in multiple organisations, he would play a major role in all branches of the Irish Revolution. He secured finances for weapons and the functioning of other government departments. He oversaw the counterintelligence operation, and following the arrest of Arthur Griffith, with de Valera still in America, Collins briefly took over as acting president of Dáil Éireann. When peace came, he was part of the team that travelled to London and returned with the Anglo-Irish Treaty in December of 1921. While some saw it as the culmination of Ireland's centuries-long struggle for freedom, others saw it as a betrayal of the Republic, and the country slid towards civil war. By the age of 31, Michael Collins would rise to the top of every organisation he was involved with and wield considerable power. From the end of January 1922, he simultaneously held the positions of President of the Supreme Council of the Irish Republican Brotherhood and Chairman of the Provisional Government of the Irish Free State resigning this position in July to become Commander-in-Chief of the National Army. He also continued on as Minister for Finance in the parallel government of Arthur Griffith. Following his death on the 12th of August 1922, Michael Collins would stand as the sole political and military authority of the new state. He would be dead within ten days. Michael Collins was a man of contrast. An intelligence mastermind and financial genius, he could also be naive and profoundly overtrusting. Desperate for weapons, he was prepared to talk to anyone who could offer them, providing British spies with easy access to him. On a number of occasions, the squad had to step in and deal with informers who had gotten too close to him, including some who were reporting directly to Sir Basil Thompson of New Scotland Yard. He was clearly good at making friends, but he was just as good at making enemies. Collins was difficult to work with and expected the same dedication from others as he himself put in. His letters to de Valera in the United States are full of complaints against practically everyone in the movement. He denounced W.T. Cosgrave as incompetent at a cabinet meeting and his friendship with Austin Stack would break down over similar criticism. Some biographers applaud as a virtue his willingness to cut through red tape to get things done, this meant ignoring procedure and chains of command, something he would have castigated others for. Cahal Brewer, once also a friend and ally, would become his most bitter enemy, making claims of financial irregularity against him and using his speech on the treaty to attack Collins' war record. Considered by some to be Ireland's lost leader, taken in the prime of his life, it can be difficult to distinguish between Michael Collins the man and Michael Collins the myth. I'll be examining his actions throughout the War of Independence in future episodes, and I will also take a look at other important figures in the Irish Revolution. Make sure to subscribe to be kept up to date with new episodes falling on the 100th anniversary of major events, and check out the social media links in the description. Accorda, thank you for joining me on The Irish Nation Lives. Slong of all.